I've never actually watched a whole episode, but the TV show, I think it's called Sister Wives. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Oh, you don't want to admit it. Is that what it is? You, you watch that show? I don't know why they call it Sister Wives anyway, but like I say, I haven't watched the whole episode, but and I don't know that I ever will. But anyway, I've walked into the room when my wife has had it on, because she'll channel flip, and I've come in the room, and evidently, I guess it's a Mormon family, and so the guy has several wives, and uh, the, the appeal of the show, or the attraction, you know, is the drama that comes from having several wives, and, you know, things happen that probably uh, make things a challenge. <clears throat> Myself, I've always found one wife to be plenty, when you find the right one, I think you only need one, but, you know, folks feel differently sometimes, maybe. But that show's been on my mind because of the uh, story that I want to share with you today from the scripture, and it's from the book of Samuel, the first book of Samuel, in the first chapter. It's the story of a woman's prayer, a life-changing prayer. A prayer that I'm guessing that maybe you have prayed from deep in your heart. It's the story of uh, a guy named Elkanah, and he has two wives. And uh, it gets a little dicey along the way. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to read uh, most of this chapter and just stop along the way at different points and just lift up some things and then uh, kind of build to a climax when we get to that point where we look at the prayer that she prayed. Elkanah, uh, it says in verse 2, he had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. And then comes the statement that really sets the stage for the whole story. And you, you, get, you can get where the drama's going just by this one sentence, the next line, where it says, Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Penina was able to give her husband children, but Hannah was not able to. Year after year, verse 3, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. She was evidently very fruitful. I don't know how many she had, but it's talking in plural terms, sons and daughters. So they go up to make a sacrifice, and um, she's got a lot to be thankful for. But to Hannah, it says, verse 5, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Well, you might say, well, why did God do that? Well, you know, I don't know, because... In the Old Testament especially, the Hebrew understanding of how God worked in people's lives was that God was responsible for everything. Whatever happened, the, the smallest thing, if you walked down the street and you just tripped over a stone, God made that happen. That was their understanding. And it was, their, it was out of their respect for God and their reverence for God that they believed that God was in charge of everything and every little thing. So that even if something like this happened where a woman couldn't give birth, uh, that God had, had done that. Now, whether God really did or not, well, we don't really know, but that's what it says. That God had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. Now, you start to get the scene here, right? You see where the conflict is coming from. Understand that in this culture... A woman's job was to have babies. It was the idea behind a man having more than one wife, to be fruitful and to multiply and to continue the nation Israel, and that's why it was permissible back then. So if a woman could not have children, it was a very bad thing. And other people would look down on you if you were unable to have children. In fact, it was thought that if you were unable to have children, that you were being punished. That if, if you couldn't get pregnant, you must have done something wrong. And that God was punishing you by not allowing you to get pregnant. 
So for a woman in that era, it was, it was, it was a terrible thing to have to deal with. It was like a curse. Because nobody thought very good thoughts of you. They figured you must have done something wrong. And so they refer to the other wife, Hannah's sister wife, Penina, as her rival. They were rivals for their husband. And Hannah wasn't winning because she couldn't give him any children. But Penina gave him a number of children. And it says that her rival was provoking her in order to irritate her on purpose. She was saying things and doing things to irritate Hannah. So what do you think that would look like? Coming to supper and Penina bringing all her kids, saying to Hannah, oh, oh, you're by yourself. Oh, I see. Oh, that's a shame. Just twisting the knife, digging it in. I got a bunch of kids. You got goose egg. And this was going on for a while in order to irritate her. And then verse 7, this went on year after year, it says. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. That's how bad the harassment was. This was an early form of bullying. She kept picking on her to the point that she would just be brought to tears and she couldn't eat. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Uh, you got me as your husband. Why do you need sons? Now, well, there's a sensitive husband. He's kind of missing the mark. So this poor woman, I mean, she is getting beat up. She's unable to have kids. Other people are looking down at her. They think she's being punished. She's got to live with another woman who keeps rubbing it in that, that Hannah can't have kids. And, and all that. And she's got a husband who really doesn't understand what she's going through. Verse 9. Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow, saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and, here it comes, and remember me. That's her prayer. Remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. That was the tradition of the Nazarites. They didn't shave, didn't cut their hair. Remember me. You ever prayed that prayer? Because you felt forgotten? Felt forgotten by other people? Your kids have grown up and they've moved out and gone on with life and you don't hear from them as much as you like and you wonder if they have forgotten you. Or you're a young person your parents are so wrapped up in their lives and in their jobs that you feel like they don't understand you and your world. Or maybe at work, your boss doesn't appreciate you and doesn't remember your faithfulness and how many hours you put in. They don't remember when it comes time for raises and promotions. She's feeling forgotten. And so her prayer, the core of her prayer is these two words. Remember me. And as part of this prayer, she's making a deal with God. If you will remember me, and if you will give me a son, I'll give him back to you. Well, she kept on praying. Verse 12. She, she kept on praying to the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. Eli's the priest. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? 
get rid of your wine. How much can this lady take? <laughs> She's already feeling cursed. She can't have any kids. Her rival is always teasing her and beating her up emotionally. And now her priest thinks she's a drunk. Wow. But she doesn't give up. So she kept on praying to the Lord. Through the whole story, she never gives up. She keeps going to Shiloh, which was the worship center, to worship. She keeps making sacrifices. She keeps on praying. She was praying, I'm guessing, from a place so deep within her that well, maybe just words weren't coming out. Have you ever prayed a prayer like that? I remember when my wife was um, first diagnosed with MS. My older two kids were very young in uh, elementary school, and it was all I could do every day to take care of her because she couldn't bathe herself. There were all kinds of things I had to do for her. And at night, when I went to bed, I, was, I remember just being so exhausted that when I went to bed, I just flopped in the bed and I just said, God, help me. That was all I had. That was all I got. I couldn't pray anymore. It was, and that was everything was in that prayer. You see, sometimes your prayers don't have to be long and they don't have to go on and on and on. But the prayers that I think really connect with God are the prayers that come right from your heart, right from your core. And sometimes they're only a couple words. God, help me. Lord, remember me. And so she's praying in a way that her, her lips are moving. Maybe she's just sort of like mumbling, but there aren't any little words that are coming out. And so Eli the priest sees this, and he says, Stop drinking, lady. And she was patient with him. I, if it was me, I don't know what I would have said, but <laughs> verse 15, she says, No, not so, my Lord. Hannah replied, I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. And that really sums it up. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. I am a broken woman. I long to have a child. And some of you ladies know that feeling. I long to become a mother. And it's not happening for me. And out of my great anguish, I am expressing my grief to God. Well, verse 17, Eli kind of gets it. It's sort of like a whoops. All right. Oh, okay. He says, and he gives her a blessing. He says, go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. The priest saying, may God give you what you want. May you be remembered by God. Verse 18, she said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Ooh. Something happened. She was able to eat, and she was no longer downcast. Something happened. Verse 19, Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah, they meaning Hannah and her husband. Elkanah lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. That's what his name means. It's about asking. The Lord remembered her. And she got pregnant, and she gave birth to a son. And in those days, sorry ladies, but having a son was so much better than having a daughter. It was a male-dominated society, and uh, the male kind of you know, carried on the name, and, and so it was, it was a bigger deal to have a son. So God not only answered her prayer by giving her a child, gave her a son. God remembered her. And that's how he answered her prayer. Well, the interesting thing is how she responds then. Because remember, she made a deal with God if he gave her a son. So, jumping up to uh, verse 24, 
it says, after Samuel was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. Going back there to worship. But this time, it's a little different. She's got a little guy with her. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli, the priest, and she said to him, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshipped there. He worshipped the Lord. This is a story about the power of remembering. God remembered her, and she remembered God. She got what she had asked for, and she gave the boy to God, which is what she said she would do. She remembered what her vow was and what her promise was. I'm not sure we always remember what we promise God. Because, you know, sometimes in life we get in a tight spot and we might say, Lord, if you just help me here, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll join the church or I'll, I'll go every Sunday. Or... And then we get out of that tight spot and things get better. And then something might remind us of what we had said. But you know how that voice goes in your head and how you can talk yourself out of stuff and say, well, that was back then. And I was really emotional then when I kind of made that promise to God and you know but God remembers Hannah remembered think of how awesome it must have been for her to finally have a child and not just a child but a son think how she must have wanted to take one of those ancient strollers and take him all around and say that's my boy <laughs> that's Sammy yeah to show off and show everybody I did it I'm not cursed. The curse is lifted. I had a child. I'm not being punished by God. I'm being remembered by God. God remembered. And she says, I remember too. I remember that he remembered. And so when he's just a little guy, she takes him to the temple and gives him to the priest. Gives him to Eli and says, here you go. Raise him as a man of God and let God use him. Because you know what? She's saying, I can let him go. As bad as I wanted a son, I can let him go because I got what I wanted. I was remembered. And that was the core of her prayer. And that's what she really needed was to be remembered. And the joy of being remembered and having God's blessing was enough for her to let go. To let go of the son she desperately wanted. What else can we conclude from the story other than God remembers. And God loves to remember when we remember. God remembers who we are. He remembers our prayers. And even when the answer is no, or not yet, God is still there and God remembers. And as the little cartoon characters remind us God loves us and his love is real and when we cry out from deep in our heart God hears and remembers and you know the other thing I hear in the story is that Hannah never gave up on God she never stopped worshiping and she was pretty frustrated and the prayer that she prayed was pretty honest and she didn't try to dress up her prayer to make it more religiously appropriate for God she basically told Eli the priest, I'm, I'm a desperate woman. I'm a broken woman. And she cried out to God out of her brokenness. And that was okay. Because God's big enough to take your frustration and your anger. He hears your prayer just as it comes out of your heart, even if you and I try to dress it up. We don't need to. Sometimes your prayer might have been like mine at the end of the day when I was exhausted. God, help me. Maybe your prayer is like Hannah's. Lord, remember me.
because right now I'm feeling pretty forgotten and pretty lost. And he will remember. Because he's God. And his memory is better than yours and mine. Thank God. So as I close, I want to pray for anybody here this morning who's been feeling forgotten. I want to pray with you. If you've been praying that prayer, Lord, remember me. Remember the desire of my heart, Lord. Remember how I have cried out to you. If you're in that stage of waiting for a response from God, I want to pray with you this morning. Lord, forgive us when our faith short circuits because we don't get what we want right away. Forgive us when we're impatient with you and with life. And remind us of stories like this of Hannah, who despite the fact that she felt lost and alone and forgotten, filled with despair, she never stopped looking for you. She never stopped turning to you, even in her anger and frustration. And you received her and you received her prayer, and you remembered her. O oh Lord, for all of us who may feel forgotten, our prayer today is, Lord, remember us and come to us with your great love and restore us for the sake and in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.